Karen C. is the founder of International Bridges to Justice in 2000 to promote systemic global change in the administration of criminal justice. IBJ focuses on protection of due process rights. With a presence in 48 countries in over 20 years, IBJ has supported more than 30,000 lawyers and defenders who have represented more than 220,000 detainees. A former San Francisco public defender and ordained minister, Karen's social entrepreneurship has been recognized by the Skull Foundation, Ashoka, and Echoing Green. She was the recipient of the Harvard Divinity School's First Decade Award and many international awards. Karen. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, again, I'm also so very happy to be here with Catalyst and also with my phenomenal panelists and moderators. So thank you so much. Um, it's really an honor to be here. And the first thing I wanna say, which I think is, is clear to all of our defenders everywhere, is that there is no democracy without defenders. And I think this is one of the biggest um, misunderstandings of the world. And it's something that as a global community, there is consistently you know, emphasis on elections and fair elections and whatnot. And that is fantastic and wonderful, but it's really just the starting point. It's not, um, we, we say that it's, it's what we need to have, what needs to happen is everyday democracy, not democracy every four years when you, you know, cast a ballot. It's really what happens in terms of protection every single day. So, you know, for us, um, International Bridges of Justice works on ensuring that every single person who is accused of a crime will one day, I mean, our hope and dream is that one day every single person will have access to a lawyer, and this will protect them from being tortured, which happens rampantly around the world because it's the cheapest form of investigation, and will give them access um, so that they're protected all the way through the process. For us, um, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a real journey in understanding, and even in terms of working with the international community, to, to really place the work of defenders, which is critical. I mean, we would say that it is, you know, really the cornerstone of democracy. Without it, there really is no democracy at the forefront. And if I can give one example and then also speak to a current situation, um, the situation in Burundi was very, very, um, very, very dangerous for many people. And in 2015, when there were, again, the elections in April and May, you know, hundreds of people were being picked up and you know, really just killed, just put together and killed. And during that time, that was when the country needed defenders more than ever. And it, and it was crazy because literally the international community just failed them. Everybody just stopped. They said, well, we care about elections. We care about democracy, but let's focus on you know, fair elections. Let's, let's, you can't have fair elections if you're picking people up who are protesting and torturing them and throwing them in jail. So what I will say is that um, I'm very excited too, because John Claude, who's also heading our program, is on this call. And, you know, they very, very courageously said, you know, despite the fact that the international community is abandoning us because they don't understand the critical need for defenders at this point, we are going to just keep on going. And during that period of time, um, they represented over 800 people and, and just kept going and kept going and kept going. So what we understand is that the work of defenders is critical to the process of democracy. It's not just about elections, it's about who's going to defend the protesters, but who's also going to give everyday justice and protection to people. Today we see something very similar in Myanmar with um, what's happening in the state of emergency. There are protesters, I'm sure all of you are, are very aware of this, and it's, it's a time of extreme courage and strength for people and the defenders who are also standing up. So during this period, um, we've got five defender justice centers, and they have been organizing to support defenders throughout the to support protesters throughout the country. They've been very, very successful in being able to also um, be a liaison between even parents. I mean, I was speaking with one of our defenders who was talking about the fact that you know when the parents can't access their children, at least they've got defenders who can go go be the book go between and work together to ensure justice. Um, we've been able to successfully have a number of the children as well as um, adults released. We've worked on talking about you know, freedom of speech and everything else, not only for the protesters, but been successful in working with um, even 
ensuring the release and safe return of one of the journalists. It's, it's something that's ongoing and um, really part of a greater process, which I think we'll get to in our later conversation. Um, and I will just continue to beat the point home because I think it's something which unfortunately our international community does not understand. If we're gonna prioritize democracy, we have to prioritize defenders in order for us to not just be short-sighted about, you know, the elections once every four years, but what is everyday democracy and what does it mean for the protection of people? Even in terms of the title of, you know, democracy under threat, it's really a question of um, it's under threat right now, but maybe it's been, I'm sure a lot of people will agree, also people on this panel, democracy is not just under threat now. Democracy has not been a reality for the majority of disenfranchised people in the world. You know, and today we say, oh, you know, we're under threat. No, you know what? There has been no justice. There have been voiceless people who are tortured every day, who are, you know, do not have a voice. And it's, it's time that we realize that it's not just under threat now, it's an everyday process. And we need to be not short-sighted in terms of looking at small, quick fixes, but what do we have to do to build systems in the long run? Now, how do you <laughs> deal with the question of rule of law and equity? Does equity mean, what does equity mean in the context of access to justice? I mean, I would say that access to democracy is about equity through access to justice. Um, I, I myself started um, my career as a public defender in San Francisco in the United States. And at that time, you know, I was, I was shocked to see the criminalization of race and poverty. And I thought, you know, this is so horrible. It was very hard and very difficult to be a public defender. Um, but then I went on to work in Cambodia and then found International Bridges of Justice. And what I discovered, which was extremely unsettling, is actually the criminalization of race and poverty is a worldwide phenomena. Throughout the world, people are, are criminalized. And, it, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's, seriously, it's seriously troubling as you, as you look at it. I mean, it, it, just as a rough statistic, one third of the people in detention today globally have not, been in have not had a trial. And one third is, is rough because there are countries that we work in where actually literally 70 to 80% of the people that you meet have not had a trial. And I've been in prisons where I remember walking into one prison and, and saying, you know, how long have you been here without a trial? I mean, how many of you have been here for one month? A bunch of people raised their hand. How many of you have been here for a year? A bunch of people raised their hand. Then I kept going, five years, hands raised. Eight years, hands raised. And I remember turning to the guard and saying, this was in Zimbabwe, um, did they understand me correctly? Because I said, pre-trial detention. How many have you have been here without having a lawyer for how many years? And he said, yep, yeah, we have people here who have been here years without a trial. So, you know, it's, a, it's an issue in terms of um, equity is about how do we give people the due process rights that are actually enshrined in the Constitution how do we implement them and how do we move forward so that it's not just a, um, a fancy dream that we all have, but something that gets implemented. Karen, you get the last word. Thank you. Well, I also want to say, talk about hope. Um, Glenn, my son, literally yesterday, my son was talking about Frederick Douglass and he said exactly that, right? And so it, I wish he was on this call. And I think this is sort of like the hope of the new generation that you know, can hear people like you talk about, yeah, and Lenin, and you know, how do we move forward? But he was saying exactly that, you know, that power is not gonna happen because it just doesn't concede itself without a struggle, without a voice. And um, so this, this gives me hope, you know, also that we have the young generation that's gonna move us forward. I, I also, you know, go back, going back to our earlier premise that democracy is, based on the rule of law. You have to have rule of law. You have to have access to justice. And that being so, my sense is that this is only going to happen if we have a long-term commitment to access to justice. And not, you know, sort of like easy solutions or, or when it's happy and when it's not, when it's a cool movement, right? Now, now, it's, now it's hip, now it's cool, but it has to be a long-term commitment. And it has to happen over longer periods of time. So if we look at it, um, you know, even going back to my earlier Burundi example, I, I remember um, being really sort of disheartened when we were speaking with some of our lawyers and they were telling me about a woman protester who they had defended and they said, you know, 
we stood up, we defended this woman. And afterwards, um, we took her before the judge and we said, listen, she was accused of, of cooking food for the protesters. And they said, listen, um, you could take her to the back and you see she has whip marks on her. She, she confessed because she was tortured. And the judge looked at the lawyer and said, well, you know what? That may be true. Uh, you get 10 years, which is completely <laughs> not very exciting and not very happy for the defenders. And, and, and hearing that story, my heart sank. And I, I said, wow, how do you so courageously continue to fight case by case um, when you get verdicts like this? And then they looked at me and they said, oh, you of little, little faith, which I love when they kind of like slap me and say, you have no faith. Where's your faith, girl? And they said, can we tell you, though? And they told me that, they said, just Tuesday, there was, um, there was a 10-year-old girl and she was, you know, holding a stick. The police picked her up and said, you know what? You are probably protesting or doing something like this with this. She's 10 years old. They picked her up. They put her in the bottom of their lorry. They drove her around from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And when they got, she was totally sick. When they got out, they pushed her, they threw her out and she would have probably gone to jail, been in prison, horrible things would have happened. And this lawyer said, but because Brindy Bridges to Justice has started a system of early access to a lawyer, we are there every Tuesday, every Thursday at the police station. We were there at that time and we were able to immediately intervene and we got the girl out. So, you know, it's also, it's about system change. It's about implementing institutions also of justice so there's predictability in the system and it's long-term. I mean, when we look at Myanmar, it's the same thing. It was, you know, five decades of military rule. And so even back when we started speaking with the government in 2012, they were like, yeah, a lot of torture then. Torture still happens because as we all know, torture often con continues even after democratic elections because it's the cheapest form of investigation as police are used to it. So the police at that time said, maybe we could discuss how we might work together to end this, this practice. So in 2017, we started our programs in Myanmar, which were round tables, building five justice centers where they had you know, rule of law and lawyers. And today, when this whole thing happened with a state of emergency, you know, our lawyers, they were ready. You know, they, they said, we need some additional training, we're organizing, but they have done phenomenally courageous work I think part of it is that, you know, we've got to be ready. We've got to be responsive. We've got to be ready, but we also have to build this in the long term. They, they right now, as far as I can see, are really the hope and the protection for the country as they are courageously risking their lives themselves. Some of them, you know, are in hiding. They're, they're absolutely amazing. We need to support defenders because defenders are absolutely critical for democracy. We need to prioritize them. And, and I think, you know, I take I take such inspiration all the time from the defenders because as I see the defenders, they are always saying very much like not, you know, what is democracy going to do for me? They're like, what can I do for democracy? And I think that's what each of us needs to do. We need to stand up and say, what can I do for democracy in whatever corner I'm in and, and move that forward? And also, I think one of the things that's great about being here today is that we're coming from all different places and yet we see that Democracy is a dream for all of us, but we haven't reached it. Nobody has reached the stream of rule of law in any of the countries that we're talking about. So we all have to work on it together and support each other as we, you know, move towards common ground. If I could just add, Glenn, I was thinking of um, Brian Stevenson, who said, as you were speaking, who said the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice, which I think is what we're all talking about. Two. Thank you.